Hey friends, welcome to another week of our Sunday Youth Class. Uh, I trust things have been going well for you so far. Today is Passion Sunday, and we're going to be taking a look at Jesus as the suffering servant. And the section of the Old Testament that we're going to be looking at is from the book of Isaiah, and the passage that we'll be looking at has been a favorite among many people throughout the history of the church. And while there are tons of signs and pointers and foreshadows of Jesus all throughout the Old Testament, these particular sections in Isaiah stand out in the way that they describe the mission of God's future Messiah. So let's start by opening God's word today to Isaiah chapter 52, beginning at verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. And shall be exalted. As many were astonished at you, his appearance was so marred beyond human semblance, and his form beyond that of the children of mankind, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which has not yet been told to them they see, and that which they have not heard they understand. Who has believed? What he has heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed for he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him he was despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and as one from whom men hide their faces he was despised and we esteemed him not. You can almost miss the fact that this passage begins in victory. If you skim quickly enough, your eyes might pick up some of the more negative descriptions, like disfigured, without ever landing on the first stanza that mentions a servant will be successful. Um, However, we can't seem to reconcile deep suffering with dynamic success. It's kind of tough for us. It's kind of like oil and water. They just don't mix. And we assume that they must be separate things. But God knew and understood that we would hold this tension. And so he sent the servant, his son, to bring a resolution. Suffering and success. He's going to bring them together. Jesus faced rejection. He faced abandonment and mocking. He was flogged. He took a blade to his side. And he took nails to his hands and his feet for his eternal glory. In him, God painted this picture of brokenness and then weaved it with the ultimate victory. The Lord started by explaining the servant's great success in three ways. Raised, lifted, and exalted. The servant was going to be famous. He was going to be so famous that all the other kings of the world would come to bow before him. Yet, on the other hand, this man would also suffer deeply. People would be appalled at the sight of him. Nevertheless, people will go from being horrified by the servant to then bending a knee before him. Let's keep reading. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people? And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Despite what many people would think when this prophecy ends up being fulfilled, that the servant deserved this punishment, we see that this is an innocent man who is going to be killed because of our rebellion. 
Jesus bore our sicknesses and our pain because they're a result of this curse, the curse of sin. And God the Father pierced and crushed his own son for our transgressions and iniquities so that we could enjoy peace. Because all people are like wayward sheep. We deserve death. But God the Father placed the weight of our wickedness upon Christ. Jesus stood in our place. He faced the consequence of sin on our behalf. And he was cut off from the land of living because the wages of sin is death. And as predicted in the introductory stanza, Isaiah concludes his song by describing the servant's work on our behalf with the exaltation and the victory that it brings, the success. And uh, we'll continue here at verse 10. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the enemy, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. In case anyone would falsely believe that these atrocities against the Messiah were accidental, we learn that God not only orchestrated this whole affair, but also that he was pleased to do so. The greater good that was produced by Jesus' willing substitution far outweighed his agony and his pain. Because he was victorious over sin and death, Jesus is exalted over all the earth with a name that's above every name. And in addition to receiving the glory that he clearly earned, we receive atonement and forgiveness that we don't deserve. Because Jesus willingly became an offering for sin, God the Father rewards him. Uh, Though the New Testament followers of Jesus didn't initially believe that God's son would need to suffer like this, It was only after his death and resurrection of Jesus that they ended up recognizing that it was Jesus that these prophecies were pointing to. In addition to the obvious parallels between the gospel accounts and the words that we just read from Isaiah, six different New Testament authors apply these very verses to Jesus in eight different places. So how does Jesus' substitution help us? Well, um, two phrases demonstrate the monumental impact of Jesus becoming our substitute. Uh, Well, first, our peace was on him. And this tells us that Jesus' sacrifice restored our peace with God. It made a relationship with him possible. And second, Isaiah says that we are healed by his wounds. And this healing primarily refers to the spiritual restoration and health that Christ's substitution makes possible. On the cross, Jesus removed the source of our greatest problem by atoning for our sins. So join with me now as we close by praying the Collect for the fifth Sunday of Lent, Passion Sunday. Almighty God, you alone can bring into order the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Grant your people grace to love what you command and desire what you promise, that among the swift and varied changes of this world, our hearts may surely there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thanks for joining us this morning. Just a reminder that we'll be diving into chapter two of our Case for a Creator book this Wednesday, and that'll be at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Looking forward to seeing you there. The Lord be with you. Take care.